you for coming out on a cold wintry day. So um, not as bad as forecast, but it's, everyone's nicely jammed in, so we'll keep each other warm. So that's a good thing. Um, Van Loon's, we're an independent garden centre, 50 years old last year. And we're very pleased to be able to bring these kind of workshops to um, our gardening community. We do this regularly all through the year. We hold different workshops. Winter we do quite a lot because it's a quieter time in the nursery and we can give some space over to it. Currently we um, have plans to build a new um, workshop space. We'll be putting that further up in the nursery. So maybe this time next year we'll be a little bit more comfort than we are down here today. Coming up through uh, June, we have uh, workshops with our host cleaning. That's always a very popular one. That's coming up on June 25th and on a Saturday. And then on the Sunday, the 26th, we have a new tree putting in there. So those two are always very popular. If you're interested, make sure you come along on those, at, again at 1.30. Later on in July, we have workshops on growing potatoes as well as growing rhubarb. Um, and the cafe don't like to be left out. They're holding a host of high teas including a children's high tea and the school holidays. So plenty going on at Bernaloons. The beauty of being an independent garden centre is we can choose and do whatever we like. So if ever you have any ideas about workshops you would like, please pass them on and we'll do our best to accommodate them. But today we're very pleased to have Frances Lee with us. Frances has been keeping bees for the best part of 30 years and is passionate about all things to do with beekeeping. He knows lots of tricky scientific stuff, but we're just going to start with the basics today to give everybody a bit of an introduction into their keeping. Um, so please make him very welcome. We'd like to welcome Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Hi. Oh, big house. <laughs> um, I've been with the bee, beekeeping since 1986, February, so it's more than 30 years, only as a hobby, even now only as a hobby. I, I'm grateful to have uh, Colin here, he, actually when I moved down from Darwin, I bought bees from him and he gave me a lot of advice. He is a better teacher than I am. <laughs> uh, please chip in if there is a need. Huh? Yeah. If there are mistakes, please oh, correct me. Um, I started, I'm from Malaysia, from Borneo Island side, but uh, uh, I began learning bees, not the western bee, the Apis mellifera is the western bee, the bigger one. I learned to take care of the smaller one, a bit smaller, about half the size of the western bees, the bees of Australia. But in Malaysia, there are there is one type of bee which is very big, Apis dasota, dosata, which is very big. They cannot be domestic, domesticated because they hang up on their very proud type of bees, very fierce. They hang on top, on very high, expose themselves, show off on the branches of high, big trees. And the production is between 30 to 50 kilos if you harvest them. Sometimes they build a nest in caves. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go to Malaysia and go to the market, you might, you might buy some of them. And they're very expensive because it's very difficult to, to collect them because they have to climb up the tree, the big trees in the middle of the night when it's moonless. And what they'll do is they'll light a fire and throw the fire at the, at the hive and the bees are angry and they follow the fire down while they are collecting the bees, the honey up there. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> but I, I have invented a new method. I don't know how many people would dare to, to do that and harvest them during the day <laughs> as we do in Australia. <laughs> Um, so the second type, the size-wise, is the western bee, the Apis mellifera. Of course, Apis mellifera, the western type, there are many different types, the Italian bees and all the rest. I think Colin will be able to tell us more. Then, the smaller than that is the, which I know, is the Apis uh, serrana, which is half the size of the western bee. You can find a lot of them in the villages in Malaysia. In, in fact, all the Asian countries in Northern Territory, up in Queensland, I believe they have come over from a, uh, from Papua New Guinea, from the Gulf Province, which is nearest to uh, to Papua New to Thursday Island. They have flown over. Um, 
their behavior is exactly the same, they will sting, but not as painful. There's another type which is very popular now in Malaysia or in Southeast Asia is even Northern Territory you have, I think Queensland, you, I'm sure you have, I've seen them. They are the stingless bees. They are not very productive, they produce between 3 to 9 kilos per, uh, per harvest, if they, there's any harvest, huh? between 3 to 9 kilos. And the honey is not, as you see it here, I will show to you some of how we do it in a modern way, but in uh, the, the stingless bees, they make and put honey in the size of the marble. Oh. All of them like the size of, smaller than a golf ball, it's the size of a marble, a bit bigger, about this size, yeah, about 20 cents coin size. That's the biggest they have and they fill up until it's full, they'll seal it up, just like the uh, western bees. Uh, the taste is not sweet completely, it's sweet and sour. You can buy them in when you go to the uh, South Borneo Island side, or West Malaysia you can do, uh, you, in Malaysia you can buy them too. If they are called uh, in the local language, they call it kululut, which is uh, sweet and sour. It's quite expensive, about $150 Australian per kilo. So about $150 uh, 50 ringgit. To them, it's very expensive. Anyway, today I'm going to share with you only the theoretical part of it. If you want to learn about the theory and the practical, I'll show you some videos of the queen making in the air and so on. You will have uh, we'll advertise it in Gordon's. I already talked to the manager there and we are going to organize both the theory as well as the practical. If you are really interested and want to put them in practice and put some hives in your backyard. Okay. Uh, you know the advantage of uh, having bees in uh, in Australia, you know, the, uh, the whole world is now, the bee population is declining. For some reason, the scientists have not discovered why. They're only guessing that because of the spray, chemical and so on. But in Australia, um, uh, uh, the world of uh, food product production rely on bees. About Without the bees, 30% of the food will be not accessible to us. They need pollination. Uh, very popular ones is the almond, yeah, almond fruits and all the fruit trees, the pumpkin, and uh, quite a number of uh, trees of uh, uh, this veggie and fruits require pollination from bees. So you can play a role. Uh, I love bees. One thing you must uh, have to accept: you will get stung. <laughs> you cannot avoid that. In fact, you win when you are able to stand the bite. Okay, if you are able to stand the bite, no problem. Of course, there is a, a problem of uh, allergic. Some people are allergic. When allergic, when you get stung, it's a normal body reaction. You get some swelling. You may first time you get stung, you can make a bit of temperature, but otherwise, it just after three after two three days is gone. Okay, those who having I've seen my friend having been stung by bees, they swelling from the head downward, itchiness all over the body, swelling the throat, breathless, they have to rush to hospital, ambulance quickly, otherwise they'll die. Uh, when I was in, da in uh, Melbourne, way back in 98, one lady was stung badly and she died. So, but I will also later on, I will teach you how to remove the stings because most people remove the sting Actually, it's not removing the sting. You put more poison into your body. I will share with you that information. Okay, let me share with you the society in a beehive. Uh, can anybody tell me what are the uh, people, what do you call, a uh, cast of bees inside the beehive? You, uh, anybody share with me a bit? Queen. Queen. Worker bees. Worker bees. Drones. Drones are three, generally three of them. You know the queen? Uh, they hatch once they are, uh, any egg is a potential queen. If the queen died or for some reason, the bees will choose one of them and they will feed her with royal jelly and she become a queen. And because of the amount of royal jelly she takes, she will live between two to four years or six years. But she hatches in about 16 days from the egg to hatching. 
become a queen. And of course, the first, within about 10 days, she mated with about 10, 10 drones in the air. And after that, she enters the, the hive and starts laying eggs. She doesn't leave until she's driven out. When there's a swarm, when there's another queen to compete with her, she may be too old, whatever reason, or the hive is too small for them. Naturally, they create a new, uh, new queen by themselves. They choose one of the eggs and feed her with royal jelly, and she hedges, and they'll fight. And that's why you, or during the uh, spring to uh, springtime, or between uh, September to December, you see the swarms because they bring. They fought and they were one of them defeated and they will fly with a group of bees with them and they'll hang under a tree looking for a place to live in. So that is the function of the queen. Only to lay eggs and during springtime they may lay out up to 1,000 eggs in the hole, in the in the cell. I'll show to you later on the hive inside. Okay, with the after the queen, you got a drones. Okay, you know drones doesn't bite. Has no sting, is lazy, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> drones, much bigger, you can see straight away, it's bigger, it doesn't sting, it does no job except to mate. She always only the job is her his only job is to mate. After mating, they finish with him. He dies soon after. So there is uh, only few, not many, eh? you can see them occasionally. The rest are uh, drones hatch about 24 days, longer. But for the other worker, majority of the bees are workers. They hatch from the egg to the time they, they hatch is about 21 days. And they have a lot of jobs. It's a very organized, clean society. Immediately they are hatched, they clean up their cell to allow the queen to lay more eggs or put in honey or pollen into the, into the cell. Once they finish the job, they go and groom the queen. They go to feed the lava. After that, there are other jobs like egg, they stand in front of the hive is too, uh, you know, they always keep the temperature of the hive about 28 degrees Celsius. If it is too hot, they'll blow in air. And also they need to blow the amount of uh, moisture after they bring the nectar, the worker, other workers bring the nectar and fill into the, in the cell, they need to remove the moisture. Uh, they, so they need somebody to fan, so there's some fanning to go, going on to remove until the moisture is just perfect. They, the bees will seal up with a layer of wax. And once it's sealed up, it's ready for harvesting, that means also the food, the honey will never, never, ever rot. So the only food in the world that never get rotten is honey. Once it's sealed up, it lasts for thousands of years. So, so, the, uh, so fanning, air conditioning is one. You, of course, there are soldiers. You stand in the front. You can see straight away there are soldiers guarding the front. When the wind doesn't flap, it always go this way. The one air conditioning is always very fast. You can, can hardly see the wind. But whereas the soldiers, the wind is going like this all the time. Enemy comes, they'll, they'll attack. Of course, the queen will uh, 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 queen will also produce a, a chemical. We call it pheromone, which will direct the workers and control the, all the all the hive, everybody, the the uh, workers and the, the drones, everybody. Uh, apart from the uh, soldier, uh, they also there's you know some bees die too, so they are also undertakers. They have to clean the hive, everything. They also the, the majority of them are out working, collecting nectar, uh, collecting water, collecting pollen. This is the food for the bees. So this you can see how organized they are. Uh, you early normally in the early morning you can see them collecting, bringing pollen in on the legs. Yeah, but they need pollen to make to produce wax to make the hive. So what are the plants? The, the plants required in Australia are very rich. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm new to I live in Darwin for nine and a half years. I kept some bees up there. But when I came down, of course, we have Colin here. He, is, he, he has been beekeeping for many, many years. 40 years? Many years. Many years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still learn from him. Um, so I was able to fortunate enough, but I don't have land. You know? I, I make friends with people. 
uh, I ask permission when I see certain places where there are many trees I ask permission and they agree I say I will share with you some honey so they are very happy they allow me so I got about 10 or 15 between 10 or 15 places where I put some hives and I always you know, at harvest I always share with them my purpose is to make friends not not so much with honey I'm still keeping it as a hobby I said so um, what are the plants uh, I think it's almost impossible to plant, plant enough for to feed your bees that you keep. The bees can fly between zero to about seven miles. I've searched some, look at the uh, articles. If you go online, you can see the, the how far they fly. Bees fly. They fly, they look for nectar. They will fly up to seven kilometers. Sorry, seven miles. Yes? Kilometers. I saw in this morning is seven miles. Okay. Also, oh, they mean 14 kilo, 14 maybe 14 kilometer. Very far. They for, just for the whenever there's a flow of nectar. So you don't worry about planting. If there is, but Australia you have these uh, beautiful eucalypt trees, and they are very profuse, profuse in producing nectar in the morning in particular. Whew, you can see shining thing for, at the at the cup, and when the flow is there you can have the harvest every month I, I work uh, when I came in Australia to Australia 1990 my first job was with a bee farmer I used the photograph that I had to advertise myself and got my first job with a bee farmer I worked for three months otherwise I wouldn't survive then I didn't bring money <laughs> um, here in Australia you have the eucalypt trees but unfortunately eucalypt trees don't produce flower every year with sometime between two to five years once and if you rely on uh, uh, eucalypt tree your bees will die so you, I have sometimes I have to do migrational beekeeping that means if I see the one area is uh, running out of no more be, uh, honey this uh, no flowering this year I have to move them out to another place a location and that's why it's happening so do not know necessary to have the necessary plant but you must have sufficient look around you can see mainly in the towns you don't have to worry too much because you know you have different people have different interests and and plant all different flowers so you have honey whole year round every year i keep some bees in uh, heightened area some and one some in drysdale some in a uh, banner burn teasdale through friends and those areas I don't have to worry at all even during winter plenty of nectar for them to, to, to collect but other places where I put some in Enfield near to the near the Ballarat forest the last harvest was extremely good I'll tell you uh, a, a later about this uh, production so if you're really interested uh, go to the you need the practical because more all of us are scared of being stung so you need the practical to drive away that fear when I came when I learned 1986 as a young man 19 uh, uh, about 32 years old my teacher from Canada that time is a uh, api serana smaller half the size of the is a sting it's not that painful he said you must drive away your fear once you drive away this fear able to stay in the bite you already capture this interest so that's what I did he said use your hand don't use anything use your hand to collect bees they are hanging there after remove all the uh, wax and the honey and the, and the brood the rest is all bees hanging there with the queen inside we didn't look for the queen but he said go use your hand to go and collect it and from then on I defeated the queen the bees no fear whatsoever of the bees oh okay it's okay okay yes. now let me share with you what is made out of the hive or oh, you can see mine is a, a bit different shape the one that is uh, I bought from him Colin are the ones that is with the hole on the side they are the factory made hives still has his license yeah. <laughs> 819 <laughs> yeah so those ones are the one that I bought from him 
But these ones, because I want, I'm semi-retired, I do a bit of lecturing in the, in the Golden Tiff. Other days, I have my interest, I have a hobby of carpentry. So instead of buying them, it cost me about $35, whole set of it. Eh? I'll show you the whole set of it. You need to have a carved elite. The top here is called the... Uh, I know. Uh, yes. Uh, there are diff two types of uh, bo box. This type is for old people like me. <laughs> okay, this is the lid. This is the ideal. With the honey, maybe 15, 16 kilos. So it's easy for me to lift from this height. But if it is the full box, you can, I used to, uh, until I suddenly started this, this uh, coming spring, I will use all this now, following your advice, getting old. I used to have, most of the bee farmers, young people, use the full depth bee box, 24 centimeter, whereas I only use 15 centimeter. These boxes I made myself, I collect wood from uh, pallets, which they throw away, pallets. I cut them and I buy a, I bought a, what do you call a router, and make grooves and so on. Before I did, I used a piece of wood to make sure that it can sit on it. Now I use a router to make holes and almost the same as I buy. It costs quite costly. I'll tell you the cost of it. Eh? The lead is about $15. The base is about $15 too. The box is with the painting, everything, screws, everything, $35. You need three boxes. Uh, the each frame in there, each frame, the full length ones, $5. So if you, in each box, there are eight frames. So eight times four, sorry, eight times three. 24, 24 times 5, eh? 24 times 5, it's a, uh, you have to calculate, I, I calculated, <laughs> total is about 255, something like that, okay, so that you, that's what, uh, if you were to buy from uh, a, B, uh, a, a supplier of B supplies, you have to spend the amount of money, I don't, because I just collect from the, whoever wants to give away the pallets, I cut them up, in my enjoyment time, I make the boxes myself. They function the same way. Oh, sorry. Um, what else I need to tell you? So this, those are the boxes. Then you got the uh, the hive knife. You need, very important. You know, once they are functioning, there are bees in there. Is you cannot open with the hand because it's so tight because of the glue that they collected from the trees and plants called the propolis which is an antiseptic the Japanese use high demand of this, uh, chemi this uh, chemical uh, collected by the bees you can see them you put the cover on you will soon after you see it's hardened with the uh, glue which is a propolis and you cannot you have to use this, this is a special made. Uh, you go to any of the bee supply, you can buy this knife, you have to open it. And not only that, inside there, they are all glued together, you can't, you can't, you, you have to break them up, you have to crack them. Then you can lift it up. And to lift it up, I use this end, lift one end first, hold on to it, and then, otherwise you can't lift it. It's all so tight. So, this knife is very, very important. Without this, you can't work. And then your brushes, you know, if once the, the frame is mature with the, a lot of honey in there, or you, or each frame here, we start with the foundation with only the mold of the holes, exact holes from the scientists, they know how big it is the, the holes are. And you put in, and they'll build about one centimeter to half an inch of wax using, you know, from the collection of the pollen. They eat the pollen and they produce a lot of wax from the legs or underneath the abdomen. They will make the holes, extend the holes to about one centimeter to half an inch, like this. Only foundation in there is original. The rest is all belong to done by the by the bees. So they will fill in with the either 
you know the top layer is always honey so scientists uh, have invented the way how we do it so in the same way bottom two boxes are the, for the brood for the eggs the queen knows it they do it they only lay the eggs underneath they don't lay the eggs up here eggs lava pupa all underneath underneath the two boxes we prevent the queen from going up using a queen excluder to exclude the queen and ask her to stay in down there and lay eggs for us whereas the other bees can go through this is a queen excluder the other bees can go through but not the queen okay so this very smart way of the so whatever uh, honey they couldn't finish they'll store it up there and we go and steal it we go and harvest it sometimes because the the bees they'll make uh, the brood is like a hill going up to the second box so you can still can collect one or two frames from the side so sometimes I do go in and collect uh, one or two frames normally one frame from the side of the second box which is meant for laying eggs but they didn't lay the eggs they put the honey there so I went still I go in and collect it and uh, I still can get about uh, eight up here down there two ten frames get about 15 kilos easily of honey Um, so the brush once you have harvested you see that it's already been sealed up there's a time to harvest I shake the bees in front and there are still some bees there I have to use this brush it's important to brush away all the bees and you put them uh, in another uh, in another box to bring home so this does that function uh, clothing you need to have uh, protective clothing uh, I used to use this one uh, or this is very simple one there's one that is with a suit uh, zip up everything yeah but on the in summertime very very warm and i discover it's so in one of the uh, uh b supplier this suit looks very thin uh you think you will sting through but it doesn't very very good but you need to have a hat uh, like japanese one you know with the flap at the back because when you light, when you bend down, it hits your back. And the bees, if it see, stays here, it will sting you. So the cloth, this head is very useful. I should have uh, sewed it so it stays on, on the side. Yeah? So this, this one, you can, it costs you $50 at the supply. I, I provide all the supply information. Yeah? There's one local one you can buy from. You can get it from uh, Melbourne to uh, somewhere in uh, Chattanooga, beyond Chattanooga a bit, called Red Path. You can go to the website and look and compare the prices yourself. Okay, so there's a the clothing you need to have. You need to have the glove. We have the glove. Oh, I didn't bring the glove. So you need to have the glove. But even in spite of the glove, you still get stung. When they're angry, occasionally one or two will sting through your glove okay they'll sting through so it's just it's a protective clothing you need to have as a beekeeper as a hobby or as a professional oh then finally we have the smoker it's a smoker you need to have the smoker people there are two reasons i, I was told why you need to have the smoker you need to have it to produce a smoke a puff into the front and puff into the, the cover when you open it it's important there are two reasons they say one is because once the bees feel smell the smoke they know it's there's a fire they are quickly go and gouge the honey ready to run when the fire comes so they don't have time to for you so that's one reason another reason to me is more logical is you destroy the power of the pheromone the queen produces to ask the bees to attack you to me there's more logical maybe there are two these are maybe two both logical i don't know so you need to produce this smoke without the smoke more bees will sting you uh how to make smoke uh i learned that uh, using they use very popular one is the pine needles produce a lot of thick smoke but they die out quickly so what i learned i i use a different method i use the egg case it works like mosquito coil it doesn't die so it doesn't produce much smoke so what i do is i'll cut out some green grass and put on top once the heat is there they produce a lot of smoke when i was in papua new guinea i 
Of course, after uh, finishing the study, I went to Papua New Guinea for five years. There I taught, I had my club of bees, uh, beekeepers. Uh, they are playing, uh, we don't have pine needles, what do we do? But they have plenty of coconut, dry coconut husk. So I use the husk, it burns exactly like this. When you start on one end, it will not stop burning until the other. It produces a lot of smoke. So, um, uh, people here also use Haitian, Haitian bags, what they call Manila bags, to start the fire too. Then they will also slow, burn slowly. So this what I, these are the tools you need to have to keep this hobby. But you only buy once and that's it. This one will last you for 20 years at least. So very good investment. It will re give you return within two harvests. Uh, the uh, it will take the first year, you will take 12 months. First time you harvest, it will take 12 months because it's about four months. The queen will build enough workers to fill one and build enough uh, wax, everything, to fill out one box. There are three boxes normally. So it take 12 months to fill, to fill up, to have the first harvest. But in, in this case, because I don't, on my age, I use the ideal, huh? you call it ideal? Ideal box, so it will fill up the same way in 12 months. But you don't have to use too much energy. I prefer this one, from now on. Um, Okay, now I share with you where you can put this uh, hive. You can't put it anywhere you want. The Victorian government requires you to allow you to, in a city, two hives within your block. If you've got bigger block, they, I, I put more hives in a bigger block. Five acres, I put more hives there. But in the city, in the town, Victorian law allows you to. Must be some distance, about a few meters distance from the, the fence, your neighbor. Okay. Um, also, it requires you uh, because afraid is afraid of the sun, direct sun, because it's very low temperature. What you call melting, very low melting point. Even the hot water from your tape is enough to melt the wax. So it cannot be exposed to the sun for too long. So I advise all my hives are under a, under a tree, exposed to the morning sun, but not afternoon. I also put. Uh, another layer of, uh, I put another piece, two pieces of wood on the top, as uh, Colin has uh, done before, and put another piece of plank on the top, so that if there's any heat or sun, it all has to go through the plank before reaching the box. Okay? So, it's afraid of the sun, it's also afraid of rain. So how do you defeat the rain? The rain, when they come, they come in slanting and go inside the car. So what you need to do is slant, hide a bit forward, so the rain goes in and goes out. So there's one method. Uh, I think there's a final method, which I think not many bee farmers in the world does that. I do that. Have you heard of divining? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I suggest you all my hives, I have to use this. Anybody, not any, uh, some people say only specific people have the power to do this. To me, any one of you can do divining. He can test, uh, Colin can testify. I say, which hive is the worst? You don't expect no honey at all, very bad. He said, there's one hive there. I show this to him and I tested it. It's exactly where they cross. And there's a place where you should never ever put hives there. I'll tell you the incidents I had in, my, in Darwin. Under my house in Darwin, I had put three hives. One hive, no problem. You know, each hive has got eight frames across, three boxes. The second box, the bees only build until number six, refuse to go to number seven, number eight frames. And the last box only built to two frames, number one, number two from this side. I was wondering what is happening. I learned this when I was given a scholarship to go to uh, Israel. I learned this skill in Israel from the Africans. They have used this to find water. I'm sure here the same thing, you use this to find water. You should learn this skill. I'll show you where it is now, so that you know the effect of it. You know this is made from a cloth hanger. Just take one cloth hanger, unwind all those uh, wire, and here it is, you cut it to half, and here it is. Make them free to run, shoulder width, but incline further a little bit, yeah? If you go this way, it will hit you. 
that is not going to work. It must forward, go forward a little bit, shoulder width, and you see how it works. I'm holding now, I let go. It is here. Look. And here all is forever. Should never ever put hives here because they couldn't take it. The force is there, it couldn't take it. In fact, I went one step further. In my house where I sleep, where I sit, I make sure I don't sit on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> so, all my hives, I make sure every time before I put down, because once you put down, you cannot shift it. Uh, if you want to shift, yes, you should shift outside the range of the bee uh, uh, nectar collection area uh, distance. If you, let's say the bee can co is collecting nectar about three kilometers or yeah, three miles, you must bring your bees further than that. Put outside for about a month, get, let them get used to that, and then you come back and shift it anywhere you want. Otherwise, if you shift it to there, the bees only been programmed. People tell coming back early when the bees go out, they come back and dance and told them for a certain distance, right, left. And you go there and collect. When they come back, they'll come here straight, straight away to here. They wouldn't know there. It'll take some time for them to recognize this, the bees are there now. So you cannot shift the bees hive anywhere. So you want to put down, put down here for a long, long time. If you want to shift them to another position, shift them out of the range of the bee foraging area first for about a month. Let them get used to that area first and bring them back and put them where you want to put. So very important information. Uh, I'll give you time to question, do do questioning, huh? You got plenty of time? Okay. Uh, uh, wait, the next, next part is uh, when to harvest. Uh, as I said, depend upon the nectar flow. When I was in Bathurst, I studied in Bathurst when I came in 1990. Uh, for three months, I was working with the bee farm, professional bee farm here. It's got 800 hives. And he collected uh, honey about 16 drums per month. He was sent down to Sydney to Capolino. Uh, when I was there with him, he brought me to a place in mountains, range of, I think purple in color. It's a flower of the Patterson's Curse. The farmers hate them, but it's a very rich for honey. Every two weeks, we'll go and collect the honey. Every two weeks. So, depending upon honey flow, if the honey flow is in, if you are near to a state forest where there's a lot of forest and eucalyptus trees are flowering, you better go and check every month or even two weeks, they will be full. Yeah? So, it depends upon the nectar. The color of the, of the honey depends upon the flower. The taste of it also depends upon the flower. So, you'll find the yellow box or iron bark or whatever, it depends really on the, the, the flower. Okay? Now I'd like to share with you the, about the sting. Immediately you are stung, you already given 25% of the poison. You cannot avoid it. It's not too late to call your mama. <laughs> <laughs> Done, 25%. But what I worry more, most people would do worse than that. What they, you could see the needle on the skin. Two millimeter length, or you could see the black, black thing. Huh? I will draw something on the board here. Is the brush in here? Oh yes. I'm enlarging this uh, bee sting. Sorry. This is a bee sting. It has barbs, just like fishing hook. Go in, cannot come out. So it's very difficult to get out. So what normally people do when they are stung, Mama, Mama, come! 
So the mom is excited too. So what they should, 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 should do? Should go and pinch it with the hand and pull it out. Thank you very much. Because all this poison has been squeezed in instead. So, you know this poison, this bag of poison on a, it's white in color. It's the abdomen of the bee. Of course, the bee died in two, three days. But it is still working every few seconds. You, you can see it moving. About a second, almost every second, you can see it moving. Moving. Pumping more poison in. So, immediately you, go, you get stung. You must know quickly. Use the uh, end of your nail or something sharp. Scratch it from the surface of your skin. That will stop the flow of the poison. So remember that. Okay? Even though you don't get into this hobby, but if you see anybody stung, use that method. I always use the nail to do it. But occasionally, I get stung. Couldn't find it. What happened? It will still pump and until the whole needle will go into your skin. And you eat for a few days. That's what happened. Okay, so take care of the sting. So you know today how to deal with the sting. Of course, if there are some people who are allergic, please send them to a hospital immediately. You can see rushes coming out. I've seen my friend having rushes. I think he was he was keeping bees. He had four hives. I helped him together. We have fun. Suddenly one day, one sting only is enough because I think he has taken some hot. Uh, pro problem tablets, medication, medication, medication. So they could have uh, create such allergies. So if you see such allergy, please send them. The heartbeat is very fast, and the person is almost breathless, face red, rushes coming out all over the body, each. Okay. So that's the way how to deal with uh, 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 these things. Okay, now I share with you where you can get this. I, there's one bee, uh, bee farmer, his name is John Evans. I leave them here. It is on the Lower Danik Road. Give a call to him and if whatever things you want to buy, you can buy from him. Wax, anything you want, knives, anything. Clothing, I, in fact I got it from him. This new one, which is very, very good. I don't use this only emergency. When my friends come and visit me, I let him have that or her have that. I use this one. Of course, I suffer. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is it. And also, there's a club. There's a big keeping club. If you're interested, the third Friday of each month at Belmont Library at 8 o'clock. Sorry. Yes. They're changing. They're oh. Going to the Masonic Hall in uh, Regent Street. Say again. Masonic Hall, Regent Street, Belmont. Please, I don't know the place. Well, okay, at the moment it's at the library. Okay. But they're about to change next month. Oh, they're going to change next month. So, can you know telephone is here? Everything is here. Give them a call. They got, I don't think I have enough card, maybe one family, one card. Uh, the telephone number is here, or email is here too. Ask them when is the next place, okay? every Friday, uh, third Friday of each month, you can go and join the club and listen more, ask questions uh, yeah, and, and get information. And if you are really interested in keeping the bees, there's another one organized but will be practical, cost you a bit, you can golden tape, which I will be, uh, I'll be researching which are the things to be presented to you. Uh, and, and so on. I'll show you what dosata, how the dosata, uh, apis dos, dosata bee look like, how the apis, uh, what they call the stingless bee look like, and so on. So it'll be quite interesting how the bees, queen mate in the air. Um, what else? Uh, interesting. You can go to, web, to the YouTube and, so, and see all those uh, interesting things going on. You learn. I'm still learning. I'm not finished. I mean, I'm not as fat. <laughs> I learn a lot from Colin. <laughs> Uh, what else I see? Oh, a few things uh, of unique thing which about bees. If you do keep them, it's no problem if you use the mower to mow in front of the, the grass in front. But you cannot use snipper. The sound of it they don't like. The big machine one they don't like too. Pushing around, no problem. You move around in front, cut the grass in front, no problem. So that is my observation. Huh? Another thing, they are, they are not colorblind. Remember, they are not but they are very prejudiced. 
<laughs> they do not like anything black. <laughs> so if you're going in without any uh, clothing or protective clothing, they go to your hair if your hair is black. First thing. Even the stingless bee, they also go for your hair because your hair is black. Anything black. So you have to watch out. Don't wear anything black. You have to wear a uh, brighter color. Not necessarily white, but brighter color. This one, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Another thing I observe, we observe. You know, our old days we used the toss light with the light bulb. Yeah. Oh, they are they. You know, the light bulb that is orange in color. They really attract the attract the, the light at night. If you go there at night, but if you use LED for some reason, they are not attracted to it. You can I use the the uh, I switch on and I could work uh, uh, around the bee. But of course, you don't do anything with the bees at night. Maybe you shift them around after all oh, have gone in after sunset. Seal the entrance. Okay, you do everything only. There is only time you do it at night. Otherwise, do it during the day. During the hot sun, at ten after ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, when the sun is out, when the bees one third of the bees are working, you only dealing with two third of the bees. So when the sun is out. Don't work during the windy day, don't work during the cloudy day. All of them are in there waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> One time I was in Papua New Guinea, uh, in the mountain, uh, if those who have been Papua New Guinea, the, uh, the eastern side, in the plateau, uh, uh, the place is called Daga. I was there, I visiting friends there. Uh, I went to the toilet in the, in the afternoon. So. He, a friend of mine brought me down the hill, go to the toilet. I was there for a long time, <laughs> and my friend was worried that I, I was I could not climb up from the hole <laughs> because he thought I had fallen in. <laughs> but actually not. I was watching the bees. <laughs> the bees are attracted to the urine, oh. the urea from the. Uh, they are taking things from there for food or whatever. Okay, <laughs> so. There is some of the, the things I uh, I observe. Okay, now it's a time for maybe for question. Oh, I want to answer one question first. You know the latest invention or discovery or invention by the one couple, father and son, in some way in Barren Bay somewhere. Yeah, they could just twist it and so easily you could see the honey flowing out. The principle is very good. Flow high. Huh? Flow high. Flow high. Yes, it costs you six hundred dollars each. The principle is the you know the hole is six corner holes. They twist it so that you. It twist go up like that one of them go up so there's a breakage so that's where they flow down to the next and so on. eventually go to the cutter and come out and you can collect it you can't do it here you know why because they crystallize once they crystallize your six hundred dollars gone you cannot unless you heat up the whole thing so in the tropical area, no problem. In Malaysia, Northern Territory, Queensland, up there when it's warm, no problem. But still, you need to go down occasionally to see how the queen is doing. You need to open in and see what's going on. Of course, uh, $600 is only for that invention, the top part. The other parts are still the basic, the same. You need to check how the queen is doing. You need to, uh, maybe you need to have two boxes. You need to go in and see how she is doing, how many, what are the eggs, or whether they are eggs or not, or whether they are sick or not. You need to go in and, and check. And you see the queen is getting too old and not producing enough workers. Unfortunately, you have to go and kill it. Buy a new queen from somewhere else. You can buy uh, three type of uh, queen from John Emmons. One is queen sales. Before they have, you know, 16 days. A few days before they sell, they, you can buy very cheap, $5. But you have to wait for her to hatch, and then to be matted in the air, and then for her to lay eggs to make sure that she is good. So it takes a bit longer time. The other one is just hatch, virgin queen in a cage. You must make sure you tap it up. If you combine a few of them into a, a hive to transport somewhere else or overnight, 
make sure you seal up the entrance I made a mistake I bought our five I didn't know I thought you were all right next day but when I went there next day all came out <laughs> what could I do I couldn't do anything <laughs> I hope for the best only one I think they'll kill each other and then left one so it was okay now so another one is you can buy the whole set of the uh, queen meta queen producing with four frames called a nuke or the starter hive it costs you can buy from him too or uh, if it's queenless uh, sorry unmated queen costs me i can't quite remember now five is for the sale could be ten dollars but the with the queen i think 25 yeah with the queen is 25 but with the uh, brood and so in small brood is 250 according to him this afternoon i went to see him I said I want to advertise for you. He's a very good man, and uh, I always buy because he's here nearby. I don't go to Sydney to 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 Melbourne to buy it. Okay, any other question, please? Yes. Uh, olive tree flowers are they good for bees or not? Oh, I don't know. Colin, you have any idea? It? Olive trees, olive trees. Ah, uh, not very. No. Not very. Just like grapes. No, no. pollinate. Pollinate. No honey. Yeah, no honey. Grapes too. I put my hives in. In fact, uh, through connection uh, through Haiti, the book club, I put some hives there in the vineyard. Then uh, the flower too. No, absolute nothing. I only hope for the eucalypt tree surrounding the vineyard. Hope for those. Any other question? Yes. What Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. I'll come to you. Hives. Say again. What about a wild hive? Yes. What should you do? Okay. Um, if you want to help, uh, if you see the uh, what they call swarm, there's one way of catching it. Get a box and put it underneath. Make sure if you want, I normally leave it there for a night or until evening before I collect them, bring them home. You make sure I use the wire to make sure they are the right position. Otherwise, they can't take it. So once you're putting it to eat, you shake the tree and cover it and leave it there some bees some of not only about everyone will go inside some bees will go back and tell them the hive is here particularly if the queen is in there <laughs> they'll go and tell go back and tell them uh, i now i after uh, 30 years away from the, the, the place where i learned the bee i now i go back to give back to them so i teach them how so the, all the bees are in the wall so uh, we collect all the honey from the wall uh, cut the combs with the bait with the lava and pupa the brood and tie them up to the frame and then we collect as many bees as we could from the wall put in there if we are successful in collecting the queen she about a, a two-third or three-quarter of the bees are collected some of them will fly back and tell them so by evening all of them will go inside now depends upon how difficult it is if you ask the bee uh, some bee farmer they'll charge you between <laughs> seven two hundred fifty even a few thousand if it's too difficult they charge you if you call me for free because i want the bees <laughs> <laughs> but if you want if you have got a uh, yard big yards of five five hectares or five five acres or five hectares or ten acres or ten, twenty hectares if you want to have bees in your yard if you I, if you don't mind i i can put the bees in your yard i'll give you a share of the honey okay any other oh, sorry gentlemen yeah um that that's one type of hive isn't it that's a long a lane strip is it hive this type of hive i'm asking what i'm asking is it the, there's a worry hive it's a different design hive a worry no, I'm not familiar. Maybe Colin knows. No, I'm not. No, yeah. I've seen those. Huh? It's, it, it's an English design. It's um, 300 by 300. Oh, no. Internal. Um, so it's a different setup than that. And they have frameless. Frameless. Uh, oh. Yeah, Maybe they only have pieces on the, on the top. The, yeah. Uh, they yeah because uh, uh they, some of them are uh, very environmental That's yeah true. uh they some of of course uh, i would just elaborate further on that one you can find in instead of this wooden one you can also buy in plastic nowadays a lot of plastic you need to to me i'm never used to plastic so i never buy plastic but the plastic they said you have to roll with a roller uh, a melted wax over it so that the bees will like the wax otherwise just on a wax by itself 
they don't like it not all of them will be filled up okay now in Thailand instead of going upward they go sideways yeah long one in Thailand same size of bees Western uh, Apis Merifera Western bees but they make the box long so they will still have the brood uh, in the middle but they put the honey on the side same with the uh, Apis uh, Serana which I taught in uh, I teach in Malaysia when I go back for two weeks go to villages I teach them also this method because it's very costly for them they're not easy to they don't have the carpentry tools and so on to make boxes up and stage by uh, stack up like that so I just tell them what measurement you need to have but the width the width is very important yeah the width of this is 35 millimeter for our Western bees if bigger than that if there's a gap they're inserting under a comb it's difficult for you to do harvesting smaller than this they end up unable to go up for putting honey or whatever particularly if it is on the side I always remember when you have the box make sure they push them to the middle leave some cap on the side otherwise sometimes you don't get honey on the side because they couldn't get up to put it in so you must make sure they push them to the side so when I make my box I make sure I have one centimeter half a centimeter right half a centimeter left to allow them to go up does, do I answer your question a bit? Yes. I, I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, that uh, I've seen in TV some of them were environmental, um, environmentalists, they refuse to use plastic. They said just put planks but make sure you only have 35 millimeter and no more. Then they will hang on the, the, the comb. And harvesting, there's a difficulty. When you have it just like harvesting the Apis dosata, the big one, when they cut, they also form like the same way. The, the honey will be on the top, then the pollen, then the brood underneath. When they cut the top for the honey, all this destroyed. So how are they going to solve that? That's a problem. So I, I, I thought the, uh, when I went back to uh, Malaysia uh, January for two weeks in the village, I told them to make frames but make sure you got wire there when they make the comb you can take the honey up there so you won't disturb destroy the brood underneath or the pollen underneath and they will continue to, to fill up otherwise how are you going to solve that <laughs> you remove the honey <laughs> unless you don't remove any touch anything that's in the middle where the brood whenever there's a brood there's always a bit of honey on top the honey will be more as you go out and you can collect all the honey out there no problem you cut the wax Yes, sorry. Uh, do, you have, do you have to be accredited to have bees or can anyone just... Uh, anyone, so long as you follow the Victorian government or regular DPI regulation. Yeah. yeah. It's good that you can join the club, if you think you can hear more. Uh, Colin may know better. I, <laughs> I came here, I bought from him, I started. I did that in, uh, da in Darwin. I had, uh, I owned them. Before I left, I had seven hives, and they are all producing very, very well. It's whole year round. I like here five months, nothing, because they have it from uh, end of uh, April. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, end of April. I said day. I was told. I said day stop. So from April, May, June, July, August. End of September or uh, four or five months, nothing. Sometimes you have to feed them. This year in particular, I'm worried because I harvested in the April one, I took almost all of it. Mm -hmm. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning, as I said. Anyway, uh, so five months, you have nothing then wait for spring when the spring time come watch out there's one thing which you may face in or in the spring time it always every possibility of swabbing you may disturb your neighbors and the neighbor may be cross with you that's the end of your friendship <laughs> okay so you can prepare you can prepare uh, if you can prepare some empty boxes sit somewhere make sure the right position sit waiting for the bees to come and go in i collected quite a few through that way where i put hives i put a few there waiting for the bees to 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 go in and i collected and if there are those friends who have seen bees hanging there they call me i come and collect for them for free because i need them yes any more yes sorry so this is all parasites oh yes parasite uh, 
very fortunately Australia is the only country this we claim to be only country but when I went to Samoa they said they're only country too <laughs> they said what do you call Boroa might the, the insect that's the size of it will break the the thorax on the back the, the insect only cling to the back of the thorax of the bees you can see how small it is I think it's a, it will break the rice into half that is the size of it they cling onto the back and suck out the blood of the bees and die many areas in the world have the oh, many parts of the world most parts of the world have that disease or the insect very you can get them you can uh, get rid of them through some chemical you can buy from i i know it from new zealand you can buy them in when i was in papua new guinea i was there for five years first time second second time three years third time one and a half year i always see them clinging on the back but somehow they manage Australia is the only country we don't have. I don't have any. But there's another insect we call the beetles. There's problem with beetles. Uh, many farmers put a plastic sheet on the top for some, some reason, maybe to prevent the bees from make, making combs on the on the cover. You know, there's a cover here. My my all my hives do not have any plastic sheet. I remove them because if the bees are so strong, they don't have a place to hide. So, I have combs full, sometime when I was uh, just a bit late, full of uh, uh, wax and, and honey, full of it. When I leave, oh, it's difficult to uh, break open. And what I, please do not put any plastic sheet to prevent the bees from making wax onto the top or fill, filling up the top. Because that's where between the, uh, the, the sheet and the, 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 the frames, yeah? That's where they hide. The bees cannot drive them out. They are hiding inside. They will lay eggs in the in honey. And they'll hatch out lava from the inside from the cell. Very difficult. And the, the, the honey becomes jelly. It becomes yucky now. You cannot use that. So there's a difficulty in, in, in I mean talking about Geelong. Of course the American brood is another disease. Smells horrible, rotten. I was another thing you was watch out. Make sure people advertise to sell this uh, whatever equipment. You don't be very careful because I bought it from one guy. I thought very cheap. My two of my hives died because of that. But somehow I was able to manage it. I use fire to heat up every frame. Use the blowtorch to blow through the holes of this uh, through the holes. Make sure all the germs are killed. After that, no more two hives died. So that is the problem in Geelong area. When I was in North Northern Territory, there are two big problems. All in Southeast Asia too. In Malaysia too. Two, uh, Malaysia has one big problem, that's the ants. Ants are in competition with us. Ants not only to eat the honey, the ants come and take away the, the brood. They carry the brood away to eat because you know very tasty. Sorry. Mm. You know brood is very tasty. <laughs> It is very testy. <laughs> Sorry, I will soon tell further. Anyway, <laughs> the other one is the frog, the toad. Sorry, in Northern Territory, the toad has spread from Queensland, from the cane farms, all the way to Northern Territory, to, together with the trucks. And now, all over uh, Northern Territory, you have this enemy, the toad. So what do I do? You have to live at least one and a half foot away from the ground. I put bricks, you know, the uh, cement blocks. And then you put the box on top. If the ants come, I put another tin. You know, the tin that is they fill it with the, uh, tin, small tin for what they call the peanuts tins. I put PVC in there. I cut just maybe half a foot or one centimeter from the rim of the uh, the height of the the PVC sitting inside and pour a motor oil in there. So the ants have to cross a sea of motor oil before they go up to my, my bees. So these are the things uh, people in Northern Territory face. Here you can put on the ground, no problem. <laughs> Any other question? Sorry. Uh, Colin, please help. If anything, please, you want to share? No, no, no. I'm just listening, learning. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Yes, one more. Yes. Um, my understanding is that if you, if you have a particularly nasty hive, uh, Aggressive. That's because of the point. Yes, it's a breed. Uh, I used to buy from uh, 
uh, some some of my one a few of my house are very very aggressive. Also depends upon the day. Also depends upon the uh, the uh, uh, honey flow. If there's big honey flow, the bees are a bit more aggressive. But major majority is because the queen is you buy a good queen. Queen is very calm, no problem. I used to buy from uh, I think Wangarata or somewhere, no, uh, somewhere, Wanambo somewhere. Uh, it cost me twenty five dollars each. But you buy a lot, seventeen dollars something. I buy ten, so yeah. Or you can create yourself by catching. You can see in the web website how to do it by catching the queen first, put it on another place, and they, as I say, every egg is a potential queen. They will choose from among the best, the best egg, and produce a queen. Not only one queen, many queens. Yes. Any more? Yes. Can be Okay. Oh no. No. It must be very fine like that. Okay, no, but is this got what we've got a frame over our orchard we've just built and we've put this over it. Keep so the birds out. Keep the birds out. Yes. So will the bees still be able to Oh yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. For pollination no problem. Yeah. Uh, I will organize another one, as I said, if you look at the Golden uh, Tave, I think they are advertising in papers, Golden Tave, uh, I will give a, a lot, uh, both the theory and the practical. Practical means I will bring you all to the, uh, the, to the place where I keep my bees. I think I will cre uh, create a hive to let you see how I do it. Every time I harvest, every time you harvest, you can create a hive. Okay, so one hive become two hives, one become four hives, four hives become eight hives. Because so long as you have enough bees, what I do is I normally go down to the brood and take two frames, two frames with the brood. Make sure no queen is in there and put them in a separate box first, seal up underneath. Put in one, uh, one frame of honey, put in there, and the rest are just empty ones. Then go, sometimes what I do is I shift the main hive to the side and put this box there. Uh, so the worker bee, when they come back, they didn't know that the wife has the main hive has been shifted to the side. They, they all go inside. Yeah. So once I feel that is enough, I cover it and shift out of the range of the foraging area beyond five kilometers, five miles, and put in the, the spot I want. And they'll grow up. Within twelve months, I have my first harvest. So that's what I will do. I think uh, around September, October, when the weather is better. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, oh, before I forget, I must thank Heidi, the director here, for inviting me to share with you some information. It's not complete, eh? yeah, you can see there's still a lot more to learn. Thank you, Francis, for coming in today. Now what we're going to do is we'll pop up these details for the Geelong Beekeepers Club on the Van Loon's website. So if anybody's looking for those details and doesn't pick up a card, you can just jump onto our Van Loon site and we'll have all those details there. Um, and when uh, Francis has got his Gordon Tafe uh, courses ready, we'll pop those up there as well. So yeah, I'll let you know. Contact with, yep. him, with him that way. Um, so thank you very much everybody for coming along thank today. You. Thank you. Uh, now you're probably all getting a bit cold. The, co the cafe has got lovely hot coffee on the go so if anybody's after a bit of a warm up you can head over there. We also have lots of flowering plants in the nursery this time of year and I know not all of us can keep a beehive in our backyard but we can all do our little bit of flowering plant in the garden. <laughs> so thank you once again for coming along everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.